Hello, hello. Oh, brilliant. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for such a good turnout on such a foul night. It must stop raining soon, or our next talk is going to be about building an ark. Um, the crew can't make it this evening. Um, so you've got the B team doing the, the minutes. Um, I've had to put my reading glasses on because there's rather a lot of parish notices, so bear with me. Right, OK. Um, Planting Ideas, our brilliant exhibition over the road, closes on March the 16th. So if you haven't seen it, please go. And tomorrow, from 10 till 3 o'clock, one of the artists, Sarah Morris, is doing um, a sort of... She's just going to be there for the, whole, for the whole day. And if you want to go and talk to her and discuss her, her techniques and being a botanical artist, then it's the usual sort of drop-in session. You'll get in free with your card. There's no extra charge. It's just the normal museum entrance. Um, the open exhibition is the next one after that. We've had over 500 entries. It's looking really, really interesting. Um, and that opens on, I think it's the 23rd, but I haven't got that written down on my list. So the exhibition after that, Steve Poole, which is New Forest Portraits, photographic portraits, that is the friend's private view. So put that in your diaries. So that means that you will get invited to the private view on that day, and that is the 16th of May. And they're portraits of New Forest characters and personalities. And it's looking, according to Steve, it's looking really interesting. 5th of April is our next talk, and it's Nick Bubb. He's the CEO of Task Trust, which is an African conservation group. And he's also a, a worldwide professional sailor and a Limington resident. And he's going to cover all of that in his talk. We apologise for the fact that the website's been down all week, but it should be up and running again on Monday. And a big thank you to all of you who came to the last talk, because we raised over £600, and that will pay for all of our talks for the next year. So that was fantastic. Thank you very much from all of us. Right, I'm nearly at the end of the list. Um, the other thing I want to tell you is that we've got an outreach exhibition at East Boulder. You might have seen um, in the Facebook and the local paper that they've opened a community hall, the community shop there. Well, St. Barb have done their initial exhibition of CB prints and watercolours. And if you want to drop in and have a coffee and see it, you're more than welcome. So I think, yes, I am at the end of the list. So welcome to Tony. Professor Tony King, one of our trustees and loyal friend of St. Barb. Tony's going to talk to us about something warm and sunny today, <laughs> which we all need. Um, Roman villas. Tony's excavated a lot of Roman villas in his time. And he's been looking for one in Brockenhurst. And he's going to tell us all about it. Thank you very much, Tony. Well, good evening. Um, yes, that's OK for the sound, isn't it? Yes. Uh, yes, I turned 70 last week, so I feel retrospective. <laughs> and uh, um, over the years, I've been digging for 50 years, you know, since my teens, and um, dug a good half dozen different villas um, and, uh, in uh, Italy, as we'll see, also in France, which we won't see, um, other parts of Britain, and gradually, we'll work our way back to Brockenhurst. Um, what I want to do this evening is also show a, uh, a talk, um, well, a, a film, rather, which is an on-site film of uh, the site at Brockenhurst in 2022 and an interview with me, which was done by Manny Hinge. Um, and uh, so I will be able to sit down and have a little break um, about two-thirds of the way through, and then I will wrap things up by coming back again and uh, talking about what we will be doing at Brockenhurst uh, this coming year. And we are out on site today. And in fact, I will be showing you a sunny picture, but a cold sunny picture rather than a hot sunny picture, of us on, of uh, activity on site today um, doing geophysics. Well, let me... Yeah. Has that worked? No, it hasn't. Let's give it another try. 
How's that worked? No. Oh, I've got two now. Oh. Come on. Yes. OK, this is a villa I dug earlier, much, much earlier. Um, I didn't all do it personally, I have to say. Um, this site is called Setifenestri in uh, southern Tuscany, means seven windows. Um, and uh, it's the very antithesis of what you get in Britain. This was owned by a senator whose name we know, and we'll come on to that very shortly. Um, and uh, it's a site that survives as uh, structures, effectively, um, and it's got a house on top of it. Um, so it's a, quite an impressive place. Um, and as you can see from the, uh, the outline, that's for rest restoration of all the roofing on it. Um, and it is, as I say, a senatorial villa. Uh, we can see the living quarters in this bit here. We can see um, what we will... Uh, that was the workshops just there. And uh, you can see how it has... These are the seven windows. I know there are more than seven of them. <laughs> but there, there, at one point, there were only seven that were open, and the rest were all blocked up. Um, and it's built on terraces, and it had gardens, and it had a miniature town wall all the way around it, and, that, and so on. So this gives you an idea of what people were building in Italy uh, around about 20 to 30 BC, and this lasts until the uh, 3rd or 4th century AD. And it's got mosaics, it's got wall paintings. Um, it's got what is called uh, the pars urbana in it, which means urban part. Um, and that meant it was a reproduction of a townhouse of the sort that you get in Pompeii, in Rome, and so on. Um, and they tried to, in effect, create a, a, an urban dwelling in the middle of the countryside. Well, what was also uh, at all of these villas was a pars rustica, the rustic part. And um, they, that was where the workshops were. And at Setifinestri, they uh, cr uh, made olive oil, they made wine, and they made pigs, <laughs> well, raised pigs, and made sides of bacon, which were then uh, exported by sea. This site is within a few kilometres of the sea in southern Tuscany, uh, near a place called Monte Argentario. And if we move on, um, here we can see the full outline of the whole place. That's the Pars Urbana, the um, living quarters, as it were. These are the oil presses. That's an orchard. And these all survive as walls um, actually visible in the landscape effectively. Um, and it's got a slave's quarters here. As it, as it says here, this is a publication report. It says, Setifinestri, a slave villa in southern Etruria. It's run by slaves. And that's something we mustn't forget, forget in the economy of the Roman Empire. About a third of the population in Italy were slaves. Um, and it's got, this is the quarter for the slaves. Next door is the quarter for the pigs. <laughs> Eventually, the, the slaves um, also lived underneath the main part of the house as well. Um, and the cover of the book shows lots of pigs. And uh, this is the first time a uh, Roman piggery had been excavated. Now, uh, <laughs> that may be a sort of odd first to have, um, but... Uh, uh, an ancient author called um, Varro uh, wrote a book on agriculture, and he describes the, uh, how to build a pigsty, a grand pigsty on this scale. And it's as if the owners of Setifinestri had read their Varro and followed the guidebook as to what to do. <laughs> um, and in fact, in the ancient, ancient world, a lot of the uh, senators and uh, other aristocrats were actually um, not that well versed in countryside matters. And they did need, as it were, handbooks to help them. So ancient writers like Columella, Cato, and Varro um, all wrote handbooks for how to live 
a country life, how to handle the slaves, how to handle the bailiff, and all other things like that, as well as how to raise pigs. Anyway, um, at Setfinestre, uh, as you can see here, that's the miniature town wall tower, corner tower, around the edge of a villa. So, and this is the next door villa, which has got the same arrangement to it as well. So there's a little group of these villas, all in the same area. They're near the coast, they're near a Roman, Roman town called Coza, and they were making, amongst other things, wine. Um, they were pressing the grapes, there was a big system inside the villa for making all the wine, and they were exporting it by sea round the coast. And this is where we get the person's name, because we found lots of amphorae with this name on it, Cess or Cest, for Cestius. And the Cestius family were prominent in the reign of Augustus in the late first century BC. Um, they were, as I say, they were a senatorial family. And they made lots of wine, and it was exported to Britain, amongst other places, in the uh, time of the period between the, uh, Julius Caesar getting here, and he went away again, of course, and uh, then about 100 years later, Claudius appeared on the scene in 43 AD. In that gap in between is when Cestius was making his amphoras of wine. They were loaded into ships, shipped round the coast to Marseille or Narbonne, then shipped overland to places like Bordeaux, and then by sea, round uh, the coast and ending up in southern Britain, as well as in uh, Roman France and places like that. And these, it was a lucrative trade because they were just growing grapes, making wine and so on, but those amphoras of wine were being traded, one amphora equaled one slave. So people were uh, trading um, slaves who were prisoners of war in Britain, and they would end up in Italy in exchange for amphoras of wine going in the other direction, which is quite an interesting example of economic links and all the rest of it. Um, and it all went through the port of Cosa, um, which was a relatively minor port on the coast in Italy. So, and this is where Cestius was buried. Um, now, if you know Rome, uh, this is the southern outskirts of Rome, and it's a tube station called Pyramid, Pyramide, uh, for pretty obvious reasons. Um, and it's next to uh, one of the railway, uh, mainline railway stations in Rome. And this is the Pyramid of Cestius and uh, members of the Cestius family were buried inside. Um, and there's a chamber inside, which is now empty. Um, but it goes to show, I mean, you know, this is it's a pretty wealthy family. It's the, the, the grandest villa I've been involved with excavating. Um, and one other thing just to mention before we move on, um, the Cestifinestri excavations were run in the 1970s. I was involved with students, I was at London University, and we were involved with students from Cambridge, Oxford, and London. We all went out to Italy in a collaborative effort with Siena University and Florence University. And it was one of the first excavations in Italy to actually use students to do the digging. If the traditional way of, of approaching an excavation in Italy in the 1960s and going right back to the 17th century was that it, this was a, uh, the people in charge were sort of Renaissance humanists and they were um, the people who didn't get their hands dirty and workmen did all the work for them and the, um, people studying archaeology and ancient history and that sort of thing would... Uh, do the interpretation and the thinking, but not the actual dirt archaeology. In Britain, we were all involved with digging <laughs> and had had a tradition of digging going back into the 19th century, and so everybody was used to the notion, especially with people like Sir Morton Wheeler and so on, of actually getting your hands dirty and going off and doing all that sort of thing. 
And so um, we were, the British end of the, of the project was involved in training students in Italy to, to dig. Um, and most of those people, and it was an incredibly influential excavation, because most of the students have now got permanent jobs and are running Italian archaeology today. So it was a sort of historic site from that point of view, very, very interesting. Um, and changed the course of Italian archaeology, effectively. Anyway, um, here's another villa, which I have visited, but have certainly not excavated. Um, this was covered up by um, Vesuvius. This is just outside uh, Pompeii, and you can walk to it from uh, one of the gates at Pompeii. It's called the Villa Regina, um, and here it is. Ooh, dear, sorry, press the wrong one. Um, here it is. It's Roman up to about that level. The roof has been partly restored. Uh, the ash layers um, are, in effect, up to its roof line from the eruption of Vesuvius. But um, these are, as you can see, vines. But they are vines which are planted in the holes that were left by the Roman vines that decayed. Um, so we know where the vines were in the Roman period. Um, and they come right up against the villa, basically. And this was a productive um, villa. It didn't have mosaics or anything fancy in it. It was just a sort of ordinary working farm. Um, and uh, I worked with the person who did the uh, analysis, I suppose, of the uh, vineyards and that sort of thing in Pompeii and at Villa Regina here um, to work out what the planting patterns were in all the gardens. Because we can be fairly sure what is planted where um, and uh, be able to restore the gardens of Pompeii and the vineyards and the work, uh, that sort of thing in, in these villas. So that's very interesting, but a, a unique situation. You would only get that where a volcano has covered, the, the ash has covered the old landscape. And one of the things that, um, if you go out to Pompeii, and I'm sure many of you have probably been there, um, you realize that actually you're quite high above the Roman levels. And there is an entire landscape under that ash spreading for miles which has never been excavated, never really been investigated properly, except on occasions like this. Um, and that's because it's, what, three, four, five meters underneath the present day land surface. Anyway, um, the Bay of Naples and uh, Vesuvius and Pompeii and all the rest of it, and uh, Villa Regina here, are exceptional. But another exceptional area is closer to Rome and this is the second villa which I, um, in, in fact, directed the excavation of uh, just to the north of Rome at a place called the Frozen Mountain, Monte Gelato, which I suppose is appropriate for, the room, <laughs> for this room uh, <laughs> uh, tonight. But uh, it's up here. This is Rome itself at the bottom of this map. Um, and uh, this is a survey done between two Roman roads. This leads up to Siena. That leads up into the mountains, up the river Tiber there. Um, and between these two Roman roads, uh, a survey done by the British School at Rome and uh, other people as well, uncovered thousands, literally thousands, of Roman sites. These are all Roman villas, sometimes small, sometimes larger, and so on. And the closer you get to Rome, the more of them there are. We estimate there's something like 10,000 Roman villas within about 20-kilometer 20 radius of uh, Rome itself. Now, Rome was a city of a million inhabitants, we think, in the Roman period, the first million uh, population city in the West, not in China, it came first. Um, uh, and the, it needed to be supplied. It needed to be supplied with uh, food, um, ranging from things as simple as cabbages to rather more complicated things like uh, animals and, and uh, milk and uh, that sort of thing. And 
Uh, if you take this V shape here, and as it were, turn it, take it round the clock, the clock all the way round Rome, you can see how many villas they're likely to be going all the way around Rome. If you get further out, they, the, the density drops off a little bit. So here at Monte Gelato, we're quite a long way out. Um, it's about 40 kilometers out from Rome. Um, and here it is. We got involved with this excavation. I was, um, in effect, working with the British Museum and the British School at Rome. Um, and we were digging in order to rescue this site. Uh, the road had been widened here, and Roman remains were starting to drop out of the bank into the di roadside ditches. Um, and so we wanted to investigate it, and we did five years of digging on this site. Um, and I'll spend a tiny bit of time talking about Monte Gelato. Its full name is Mola di Monte Gelato. That means the water mills of, Monte Gelato, of the frozen mountain. <laughs> um, so uh, there are some water mills there as well, but I, uh, they're not Roman. Um, so uh, it is an interesting site. It's an interesting site because it's a villa that turns into a village. Now, those two words are the same. The, ones derived, the word village is derived from the Latin word for villa. Um, in Britain, we don't have that continuity from villas to villages, but in Italy and France and Spain, quite a lot of places do. They start out as a villa, which has got a big pop... Most villas have got quite large populations, maybe up to 50 or 100 people, so they're the nucleus of population for subsequent villages. And that's what happens here. Um, it starts out in the uh, period round about the reign of Augustus, end of the first century BC. It develops through the early imperial period, and then in the late Roman period, it suddenly gets something really interesting, a church being built into it. It's a fourth century church, so that's pretty early for a church. And here it is in uh, the corner of Roman villa. And we know that um, by the 8th century, this uh, land was the property of the popes. So it had been bequeathed eventually by the private landowner to the church. Um, and uh, it ends up as a, uh, just the church uh, with a few habitations around it. And uh, eventually, it, it actually, they have to move, which is why it's, um, they move to the nearest hill town because of uh, uh, it, it, it's insecure it's uh, there's a lot of fighting in the area and that sort of thing in the middle ages but monte gelato uh, was quite a complicated site that's the overall phase plan uh, so the overall plan of the whole lot um, not divided up into its constituent phases um, and as you can see uh, that's quite a complicated thing just to see all those ro rows of uh, walls and all the rest of it. So let's tease out a little bit of it. Uh, it starts out as a villa um, with a series of rooms around a courtyard. They dig pits in the courtyard to create an artificial grove of trees and with a pool in the centre. So it's, it would look like a little orchard in the middle of the, the big courtyard. Um, and it had its own road, as you can see here. Uh, one of the classic Roman roads of these big blocks called Basilati. And um, they are, uh, it, it effectively, this was a side road off one of the big Roman roads. Um, and uh, uh, almost certainly created and laid by the villa owners. Um, so, uh, yes, nice little stretch of Roman road. It had sculpture. Um, garden sculpture, um, and it had fish ponds. Here we are. Um, as well as some traces of mosaic and wall, part, uh, wall paintings and so on. But this is a fish tank, basically, for keeping eels in. These are the holes which the eels can um, shelter in. And uh, it was a, a fish pond 
uh, not for ornamental fish like goldfish, but for eating the fish, of course. Um, and when that fish pond was eventually filled in, um, and when they abandoned it, they filled it up with a nice lot of pottery. These are the pots lovingly restored by people from the British Museum who like doing this sort of thing. Uh, and uh, uh, as you can see, um, cooking pots and serving dishes and, and that sort of thing, all dating to the end of the second century AD. So, um, the other thing that we, we have at Monte Gelato is we know who the owner is. Um, and we have an inscription, because an inscription was put into, and a sculpture and that sort of thing, was put into a lime kiln. And I'll explain about the lime kiln in a moment, but let's look at the, ins at the sculpture first of all. What we've got here is the head of one of the owners of the villa. And that's pretty unusual too, to actually know what these people look like. And this is not a senator. He's not Cestius. He hasn't got a pyramid <laughs> and that sort of thing. What he's got is a little tomb, a uh, mausoleum on site, um, and that mausoleum had his family buried in it. And that's what uh, this is, a series of roundels with the heads in them, and then below that, an inscription. And we'll see the inscription in a bit more detail now, hopefully. Yes. Um, here we are, the heads. Uh, that's the head we've just seen. And it's got various names here. This is the interesting one. Unfortunately, the head's missing. Um, but this is Valerius Faustus. And um, it says that he is a freed slave. So um, he's someone who has probably a freed imperial slave, in fact, uh, i.e. part of the civil service. Um, rather than anything else. And uh, he has got enough money from trade. And we know what his trade is because it says underneath Mercator Bilvarius. And then he's at, we know the place he comes from. This little lot of letters there is the Roman town of Vei, which is 10 kilometers, uh, 10, sorry, 10 Roman miles just north of Rome and was sacked by Rome in the 390s BC and turned into a Roman town. Um, and Mercator Bavarius means that he is a merchant in cattle. He is trading in cattle out of Vei, which is just to the south of, uh, of our villa site. And um, yeah, he's, we, we, it's good to know a person's name, what their uh, origins are, their social status, and all sorts of things like that. It's very, very interesting. So. Um, he was able to uh, decorate his villa. He could uh, create ornamental doorways. And this is one of the uh, bits of stone that we found on the site. I um, have to say, incidentally, this, <laughs> and this shows one of the perils of Italian archaeology, uh, this was stolen from the site while we were digging it um, by someone with a JCB. <laughs> and this is the only record we got of it. Um, so it's in someone's garden, I suspect, somewhere in Italy. <laughs> but that's the sort of thing that happens. Um, and and uh, we couldn't really move it ourselves. Um, and we weren't, uh, we were planning to try and get a JCB in ourselves, but were preempted. <laughs> so that's uh, the sort of thing that happens. Anyway, at um, Monte Gelato, we move on into the late Roman period when a church is built in the corner of the, uh, of the old villa. So it ha we don't know what's happening on the right-hand side of the slide, but here we've got the church, other bits and pieces here. These were once all rooms with mosaics in them, and mosaics have been stripped out, and then, it's then it goes more functional, effectively. It turns into something like a, a set of workshops and stables and so on. And it also includes this round thing here, um, which is a lime kiln. The lime kiln is there for uh, burning, oops, back again. Oh, sorry, let's go on to, yes, here we are, here's the lime kiln. It's used for um, burning marble. 
um, and that sort of thing, and creating lime. Um, and that lime is used for mortar. Um, it is not necessary to put it on the land around this particular area, but that's the other use for lime, for lime out of a lime kiln. Um, and as you can see, the last load has actually got the bits of sculpture still in it because it never worked and they went away and left all that a bits of sculpture behind. And that's why we've got the head of Faustus and, uh, and the others, um, Valerius and so on, from um, that we've just seen, um, because the last load didn't work, <laughs> which is quite interesting. So let's go back to uh, the reconstruction drawing. Um, that's what it might have looked like with the church in one corner of the villa, restoration of the church. These were fantastic drawings done by the late and great Sheila Gibson, who did lots and lots of illustrations for the archaeologists at the British School at Rome over many decades. Um, and, and again, yes, these are um, living rooms turned into stables uh, and eventually with. Uh, filled up with rubble and that sort of thing. And eventually we get more bits of sculpture, as here, just appearing in the rubble. Um, that's how we tend to find them. And here, um, that's the bottom legs of a nymph that would be a garden sculpture on the side of a pool or something like that. Um, that's the same piece of sculpture the other way up, and it's a threshold. It's, uh, it's reuse, basically. They um, don't want to use it as a piece of sculpture anymore, but they need it as a threshold to get from one room to another. So, well, um, yes, and this is the final phase. It, it gets turned into a parish church, effectively. Very early example of a parish church. Parishes are being developed in Italy from the fifth century onwards, basically. Um, and uh, it has a baptistry. It has lots and lots of very small children, infants, who are buried in, in and near the baptistry. And that was a, a clearly some practice that they had at the time, um, which is that people were baptised in death, effectively. They had died in infancy and were not baptised in the church. Um, and living on to be adults, but they were there inside the baptistry. Oh, and that's the final phase. The church alone, the villas disappeared, um, and there's a sort of village around it, effectively. It's turned into a village with its parish church, and the old villa has disappeared. Very, very interesting sequence. Okay, so let's now come to Britain. Um, and... Briefly, I want to turn to Somerset. I was involved with two excavations in uh, big villas, uh, well, one big and one smaller villa in Somerset. Uh, one's at Dinnington, which is very close to Yeovil, um, and it's on the Foss Way as it runs from Exeter up to Leicester and Lincoln. Um, and uh, Dinnington was on Time Team. It was originally discovered by Time Team, and uh, it was part of what was called the Big Roman Dig. Um, that took place in the um, early 2000s. And uh, I was involved very closely with, with excavating this and running uh, University of Winchester uh, training excavations and that sort of thing on this site. And this was found by, geof uh, well, by geophysics, but also by the local farmer actually set finding bits of mosaic in the field. Um, and Dinnington is just here. The other site we're going to look at, Yarford, very briefly, is just there. This is geophysics, and this is a quite a large area of geophysics. If you look at the, if you read the scale, these are, each square is 20 meter square. Um, and so we've got uh, one wing of a villa here, another wing here, third wing there, um, and possibly other buildings running across the front there. Um, and in fact, the entrance actually goes off in this direction. Um, and uh, that is a big villa, 
and it's got three sides around a courtyard and, and, and so on. Um, and when we excavated it, we've excavated just one end. Uh, and we found um, a row of rooms with mosaics in, still in position um, and a bigger room at the end which had been inserted and that was a winter dining room. It had a big underfloor heating system um, and it, it was a, a place for someone who was pretty wealthy to uh, entertain guests and so on. And uh, uh, that, it, and there was quite a lot of stratigraphy um, here um, for a British site. That's, that's quite uncommon. Um, and that's the, the big room at the end with its curved end, its apse. Is, this is the, all of it that's under the floor. That's the, the heating system, basically. So what happened to that floor? Well, that floor had been destroyed deliberately and it had fallen in to the area um, that we've just been, uh, you can see in the excavation there. And uh, there were lots of bits of mosaic, um, hundreds of pieces of mosaic, because the people who had destroyed it, they either did it deliberately, which is a possibility, or else what they were really interested in was the stone, big stone flags onto which the mosaic had been laid. The mosaic itself was of no interest whatsoever. They just wanted the big stone flags to use in another, another location. Um, and so here we've got sort of head of a cupid. Here we are again. Um, lots of other bits and pieces. This is uh, the head of Daphne, as in the story in Ovid's Metamorphoses of Apollo um, chasing after Daphne, who is then turned into a laurel bush to escape his evil embrace, as it were. Um, and uh, uh, this must have been a highly decorated, very impressive mosaic. If you've any of you have been to Bigner, um, you may well have seen the mosaics there. Um, the mosaics here are of the same sort of quality in terms of the way in which they were designed and the size of the tessery. The smaller the cubes, the mosaic cubes, the more expensive the mosaic, effectively. Um, but it's all been destroyed here. It doesn't still survive in position. Um, and that's the uh, helmet on top of possibly Minerva, one, or, or another uh, god or goddess. Um, and here we have, uh, at the top left, um, the leading person who un uh, studies mosaics in Britain, David Neal, in his sand pit. <laughs> um, and his sand pit is filled with pieces of mosaic, and he is trying to arrange them, make a pattern out of them. And he was able to do that. We can join some of the pieces together. For instance, here, that's a, um, a basket of some sort there. This is a big roundel. Um, this is some sort of uh, probably clothing with decoration on it and that sort of thing. But we've only got about 10% of this mosaic and um, it will go to Taunton Museum and uh, it will, some of it's on display in Taunton Museum, but it's the sort of project that will take decades to actually sort it all out. Um, in the meantime, I write up the rest of the excavation and uh, you know, do the dirt bit with the, uh, uh, the stratigraphy and um, doing the plans and all the rest of it. But uh, this is a, a big project for, for the future. But we've also got other things from this, this site at Dinnington. As I say, it's a wealthy villa, previously unknown until the 2000s. Um, and uh, an eagle-eyed student who happened to be Italian, actually, and obviously knew what sculpture looked like, unlike all the British students on the site who probably didn't. Um, and uh, uh, he uncovered a piece of rubble in amongst several hundred pieces of rubble, I hasten to say. Um, and there we have three hands, as you can just about make out. Um, and this is from a mythological scene of Hercules and Antaeus. Antaeus drew all his strength from 
standing on the ground because his mother was Mother Earth, Gaia. Um, and uh, if he was lifted off the, off the ground, he lost his strength. So uh, Hercules, in order to defeat him, is lifting him off the ground. Uh, and this is the only sculpture of this particular myth in Britain. Um, and uh, uh, there are other examples of it, obviously, elsewhere. This gives you an idea of what it looks like. Um, and uh, uh, it's uh, you know, an interesting example of people in the Roman period in Britain knowing all about classical mythology, where you had read Ovid's Metamorphoses at other villas, people had read Virgil and, and so on, as we know from the mosaics there. So they were quite cultured, and they wanted to show off, show their classical knowledge. And this piece of sculpture dates to the 4th century AD. It's after uh, Britain had ostensibly become Christian, but all of this, these pagan ideas were still carrying on. Well, um, there's also quite large, um, this is a column capital from, uh, uh, from Dinnington, but I won't say any more about that. Right at the end of the site, uh, the life of the site, the mosaics were covered over with a thick burnt deposit of grain. Um, and the rooms with the mosaics in them had obviously been converted into a grain store. And a lot of villas actually weren't able to keep up appearances all the way through the Roman period. And by the end of the fourth century, they were becoming more functional. And we've seen that story already in Italy, at Monte Gelato. So the Roman villas couldn't keep going in a fancy way all the way through. Um, and so they do uh, often become farms. You can see the cubes of the mosaic there. All of this black deposit is burnt wheat uh, uh, and grains. Uh, the holes in it are not ancient holes. <laughs> it's a modern sampling system to try and um, uh, get samples ac across it for analysis. And we can see uh, one of the deputy lord lieutenants of uh, Wiltshire here, um, Phil Harding. <laughs> of time team fame, um, who was helping out on the site. Um, and other examples of what happened here uh, are mosaics were lifted, um, and that should have a mosaic on it. It's had holes punched through the floor, and the concrete underpinning of the, of the mosaic has been left in position, and the underfloor heating system underneath is now used for drying grain has been converted into a, a, a functional system from what at one point being uh, obviously just part of the sort of uh, plush rooms of the uh, smart rooms of the villa. Um, near Dinnington was another training excavation that we did uh, with, for Winchester. And this is at a place called Yarford, which is in the Quantocks, just outside Taunton. Um, we found this through geophysics uh, and aerial photography. Um, here is the geophysics showing a D-shaped enclosure. Um, and up at this, there are three blobs just here, which we didn't know what they were. And when the excavation started, I wasn't involved, actually. Uh, they thought, aha, this is a prehistoric enclosure. Let's go and dig it, or dig part of it, um, and see what we've got. And lo and behold, those three blobs turn out to be a Roman villa with a mosaic in it. <laughs> and uh, so it goes to show about, you know, geophysics, you can't believe everything that you see. You have to get in there, do work on the ground, dig a hole, and, and try and sort it out that way. And here's the plan showing a little range of rooms dating to the late Roman period here. Uh, there's a mosaic in this room. Um, and let me just illustrate that one. That's the recording system in place with vertical cameras to record it and part of what's called the photo mosaic of the mosaic um, uh, being assembled. But it was also drawn by David Neal and, and Steve Koch. Um, and that's uh, on the, oh, I can see it there. <laughs> Yes, it's, it's gone blank on there as well now. Oh, yes. 
Oh, almost. Yes. Woo. <laughs> um, that's a, a rather poor quality uh, photocopy of the site drawing of the mosaic done by um, Neil and Kosh uh, with my annotations on it as well, in fact. That's the coloured version of the same thing, um, and that's a photograph of it. Um, this mosaic, uh, it, it survived almost, almost complete, but not quite. Uh, quite a simple um, but interesting design, as we'll see in a second. It, was, it didn't suffer the damage that we've seen at, at Dinnington. It wasn't smashed up or anything like that. But look at these holes going in a straight line across it. That is um, a damage which is done in the end of the Roman period um, by making a construction on the top of the mosaic, um, maybe a loom or something like that. Um, and they had to support the roof. That's a very deep hole, and probably it was a post going up to the ceiling. Um, so, again, you know, the mosaic still survived in this case, but it's, uh, you can see what happens in the end in terms of uh, what they have to do to keep things going. Now, the design of this mosaic is very interesting. Um, it, it's got a camphorus, which is a, uh, a sort of... A thing for uh, a, a big jar for mixing water with wine um, in order to serve it up to guests, and it's in it's a convivial idea in the sense that this is a dining room. Here we have a, a jar of wine in the centre, and it's got this circular uh, motif, and it's also got squares and rectangles and that sort of thing. This dates to the fourth century. This one, which looks almost identical, is in Colchester, and it dates to the second century. Um, and it looks as though uh, there were pattern books with these designs in them, but went, lasted for a long period of time. And also some of these designs, like the one on the right, um, were still being copied two centuries later, um, and designs were quite conservative. Quite interesting, but the only thing that tells us what the date is is actually the way in which the camphorus is, is, is designed with these curly volutes on them and that sort of thing, um, which is different from the camphorus here. So, um, Dinning, uh, Yarford is interesting from that point of view. It's also interesting because it's in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> as it were. It's on the Quantock Hills. Now, Somerset's obviously a very civilised county and all the rest of it. Um, uh, I was born, brought up there, so I, I know, as it were. Um, but uh, in the Roman period, it was on the edge of what was called the Villa Zone. There weren't many villas to the south and west of Yarford and Dinnington. You have to go right down to the very far end of Cornwall to Hale and places like that before you get to many more of them. Um, and um, the person who had constructed this villa for himself at Yarford, uh, possibly a retired soldier or someone like that, um, his nearest neighbours who also lived in villas were 20, 30 miles away. So he was making a statement to the local people, perhaps, who were still living in roundhouses. So that was quite interesting, uh, as an idea of sort of Romanization. Now, let's get to Hampshire. Um, in Hampshire, uh, there are roundhouses in the Roman period, as we'll see very shortly, <laughs> at, at Brockenhurst. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, um, a lot of we do have villas, um, and some of them are quite sophisticated too. I very briefly want to say something about me and Stoke because time is pressing on. Uh, this is to the east of Winchester, and again was a University of Winchester training excavation. It's an extremely well preserved site, mainly preserved um, because it was under a boundary between two fields throughout the Middle Ages, so that all the walls were not ploughed up effectively is what you can see in that photograph. Um, and it also preserved a collapsed wall. Um, and here we have lots of bits of tile, circular tiles and all the rest of it. Um, 
and uh, roof tiles and so on. And they all have formed a pattern. And you can see here arches there. Um, and uh, I won't go into so much uh, about the detail of it, but uh, you can see circular column tiles here, um, the skin of a circular of a column which have fallen over uh, now flat on its side. And it could, we also managed to establish the roof line, the angle of the roof. Um, and um, this was a first in, in Roman Britain in, in many respects. Um, we don't know many uh, roofs of buildings apart from temple sites. Um, and uh, the British Museum sponsored this excavation and removed part of it. And here you can see uh, the part of, this, of the collapsed wall being lifted and then deposited again <laughs> at the British Museum, courtesy of the Royal Engineers. Um, and it, uh, it was then excavated, um, and this is, this is part of our excavation team in the British Museum actually excavating uh, the lifted portion of the, of the collapsed walling. And it's now on display here um, in the Roman Britain Room um, at, uh, at the British Museum. Um, and we can get a good idea of reconstruction of this building. And this is a drawing by uh, one of the British Museum draftsmen, Steve Crummy. Um, and uh, uh, the, it's the upper part that sort of collapsed, and the bottom bit has been restored. Um, and uh, this gives you a very good idea of what a Roman villa in Britain might have looked like. Uh, and it's all laid out. This is a sort of rural building in Britain, you know, middle of nowhere. Well, me and Stoke perhaps isn't the middle of nowhere, but you know what I mean. Um, and it's all laid out in Roman feet, very carefully indeed. Um, PM means uh, pedes monetales. Um, it's for, for standard Roman foot, which is a little bit shorter than an English foot. Um, and uh, the main part of the frontage is laid out as 25 foot square. The entire frontage is 50 foot across. The side bits, if we uh, restore it as 40 feet high, are 12.5 by 12.5. The windows uh, are also 12.5 by 12.5 feet. And then these subdivide into uh, subunits of that as well. It's very, very carefully designed. And this is a fourth century building using Roman feet and all the rest of it. Um, so it goes to show a bit like the sculpture of um, Hercules Nanteus and the mosaics and all the rest of it, but there's a good deal of sophistication in these villas. And the other thing at Meanstoke um, is that we did two bouts of excavation at Meanstoke. That's the early lot with the fallen wall, which we've just seen. Then we crossed over the road, the A32, which is for Fairham Alton Main Road. Um, and then on the other side, we found a hexagonal building and a bathhouse, and indeed a mausoleum as well, square mausoleum. These are all a part of what we think is a villa, but in increasingly we wonder, is it actually a temple site, not a villa? And there is a, quite a debate to be had about what's going on there. And indeed, it's not always the case that villas are just farms or fancy country houses or that sort of thing. Even, I'm sure lots of you have been to Chedworth. Um, it's one of the uh, big Roman villas in Britain that you can actually visit. Now, this is Chedworth. It's surrounded by one, two, three, four Roman temples. Um, and was it a pilgrimage site, not just a fan uh, someone's fancy house? So villas are not always what they seem. And... Here we have Brockenhurst. <laughs> what is Brockenhurst? Is it a villa? Um, is it as fancy as anything we've just seen? It certainly didn't belong to a senator, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, but uh, uh, what was going on here? Now, this is where I can sit down, and you can hear my dulcet tones in an interview instead. 22 by um, Manny Hinge. 
One of the very interesting things about the New Forest is that it is a blank on the map as far as the Roman period is concerned. And there are very few sites known from the very heart of the forest. What we know about the Romans in, in the New Forest is that they are around the edges. Uh, places like Rockbourne Villa, which is just off to the west of the, of the New Forest itself. And uh, on the southern side, we now know that there are Roman sites in places like Leap and Cowshot and uh, along the south coast. So uh, maybe the centre of the forest never had much Roman occupation in it. But one of the interesting things that we've managed to do in this research project that we're on at the moment, we've been here for four to five years investigating a Roman site in uh, the central part of the forest. It's uh, linked to the, to the sea by one of the streams coming down to the, go, flowing down to the south, but it looks as though we have for the first time some sort of Roman occupation uh, with uh, uh, sort of classic Roman bits and pieces like tiles, the tessery from mosaics, the uh, pottery that you get from the, the, the Roman pottery kilns and, and all the rest of it. So here we are with a, a Roman site and it's a new development. The site we're investigating at the moment was originally found by survey by the New Forest History and Archaeology Group survey team back in the 1990s and they did a very careful and expert job of locating these very, very shallow uh, banks and ditches which are all that remain of most of the sites in the New Forest uh, uh, in the, of the Roman or the Iron Age, you know, that sort of period. And this was followed up with the advent of LIDAR, which is of course this revolutionary technique as far as the New Forest is concerned because it's a uh, remote sensing uh, thing from the sky which can see through the trees and then give us the contours of land underneath. And that has completely changed our perspective on the archaeological sites of, of the New Forest. So a LIDAR survey was done in the early 2000s and luckily for us the very careful survey done on the ground by the group and the LIDAR survey correspond with each other, which is a gratifying result. And the outcome of all of that was that uh, the, the surface survey had um, uncovered various bits and pieces like Roman tile and bits of pottery and so on. And so we could identify this as a potential site for further investigation. And accordingly, we came out here and started digging in 2017. And we've been here, not every year, because of COVID, of course, uh, but we've been here uh, ever since on an annual excavation, which lasts for about a week or so. And uh, we're in the fifth, uh, fifth iteration, fifth uh, repeat of this, of this excavation. And we're getting towards the end of, end of the project now. The way these excavations are organised is that we need to uh, get a permit from the Forestry Commission, uh, well now Forestry England of course, and we also uh, need to get uh, a habitat regulations assessment because this is part of the SSSI, the Site of Special Scientific Interest which covers the majority of the new forest and uh, therefore we need to get a, a, a permit to dig under control conditions. When we started out on, on this uh, project we dug in an area where we knew there was Roman pottery and Roman tile and we investigated uh, an area which actually did reveal, not surprisingly perhaps, uh, fourth century Roman pottery of the sort that's made in the New Forest uh, kilns which are some ooh, 10 miles from here to the north and we also managed to excavate one of the ditches of the enclosure. This is a, an enclosure with banks and ditches and we went into one of the ditches and we recovered what was very interesting because it was earlier pottery going back to the first century AD and that is a first really for the New Forest or at least the central part of the New Forest. So we could be fairly sure that this was a site that might have originated in the Iron Age and then it continued on into the Roman period and it goes right on to the late Roman period, in other words, the third to fourth centuries AD. So that was the first year, but we then expanded our 
uh, ambitions and aims in the second year onwards and we decided to go to a new part of the of the site as a whole uh, a few uh, dozen meters from the original first trench and we started new excavations and we've been in this second area ever since in fact because we discovered fairly quickly that we were uncovering lots of tesserae. These are the small red cubes which make up a Roman mosaic pavement and is not a, a multicoloured a highly designed Roman pavement but a plain red pavement of the sort that you get in uh, many Roman buildings and we found some in position. Now that, this was a very important development because here we have potentially maybe a, a Roman villa and that's what we fought for uh, the second, third and indeed the fourth years that we were digging here and um, things developed during those uh, second, third and fourth years and we ended up thinking okay it's not a villa but the, the villa must be nearby and we might be in the outbuildings or the workshops or some, something on the edge of what might be a rather more uh, significant site which uh, we don't know quite where it is, where it is but within a few uh, hundred metres perhaps. In 2021 we came out here after, as I, as I said earlier, a break for Covid and we investigated uh, the trench, uh, continued work in the trench that we had started on a couple of years before that and we found more of the building, we found it had a wooden wall, um, upright uh, wooden wall uh, and uh, this tessellated uh, stone floor in part of it but not in all of it and probably had an earth floor in the other part of it so we have a simple Roman uh, two-roomed building and that's very simple really compared with say an elaborate Roman villa it's not certainly not Fishbourne that we've got here it's something rather uh, rather more mundane and it may have the purpose of working Roman building material they may have been reworking they may have imported material from other places because we've got some rather fancy bits and pieces from this site circular column tiles and box flue tiles now I need to explain what a box flue tile is that's a technical term and a box flue is part of the hypercourse the underfloor heating system of a Roman villa or a bathhouse or something like that so they heat under the floor and the smoke has to go somewhere they have to get it out so they have flues these box flues which go up the walls of the building and then go out through vents in the, in the roof. So we've got some of those tiles but we've got no sign of the villa or the bathhouse or the heated floors or anything like that. So what we think is going on is that they are bringing in material from elsewhere and maybe working it in some way perhaps to create the tessery um, and uh, it, it, it may have been uh, perhaps associated with some in industry, possibly iron working or something like that. We're not unsure, we don't know for sure what is going on uh, on the site. One of the things we wanted to investigate in uh, this year was a geophysical anomaly shown by the magnetometry which appeared to be something circular. What we've excavated may be circular, but we haven't quite got enough evidence to demonstrate whether we have got an early Roman circular structure or not. Now, circular buildings are not normal in the Roman period. They, we tend to associate the Romans with rectangular buildings, of course. So a circular feature in the magnetometry might be something earlier, like, say, a roundhouse from the Iron Age or, or something of that sort. So we put a trench across in uh, 2022 to try and investigate that and uh, our current thinking about it is that there must be something going on within the circular feature that we've found. But it's all Roman. It's all, interestingly, probably quite early Roman, uh, first century or maybe very early second century. It might be a roundhouse but we haven't finished digging there yet. We are still in the throes of digging it. If we don't finish this year, it's something we can carry on digging next year.
Well, yes. If we start with, with Trench 1, Trench 1 was, uh, I suppose, an exploratory trench. It was one where we knew there was Roman pottery and we found uh, evidence running from the 1st century up to the 4th and we were able to put a section across one of the ditches of the enclosure. It's the only place we've managed to do that so far, although we might follow up and do another in the future. And uh, that was very interesting beginning to the excavation because it showed the date range and so on. Trench 2 and Trench 4, which are very close to each other, were positioned where there were buildings or building debris, um, tiles and that sort of thing. And lo and behold, of course, we found buildings, a tessellated uh, floor, and a room and uh, a simple uh, Roman building in Trench 4. Adjacent to it in Trench 2, uh, there was almost certainly another building, but much less good state of preservation. The other major trench was, uh, it was it's got a variety of numbers, but 6 stroke 9 and then ultimately 10, but let's call it Trench 10 for short. That was uh, a ditch filled with debris um, and uh, a lot of stones in it. Uh, quite a lot of pottery dating to the second century and very unusually it had animal bone in it. Uh, very rare to find that in the forest because of the soil conditions and those animal bones are almost exclusively sheep bones and therefore we have to start to think about what sort of animal economy we're thinking of in the forest at this time and was it a sheep economy? Were they running flocks of sheep in, uh, uh, in fields and pastures around here? And then this year we dug Trench 12 uh, and Trench 12 is the circular building potentially uh, as detected by the, the geophysics um, and uh, we're in a, still in the throes of digging at. Uh, a week of excavation has proved not to be enough for Trench 12 and we will certainly expand it and, and continue with it in, in 2022. What this excavation has shown us is, one, that the Romans were here in, in effect, the central part of the New Forest. And secondly, that it's not just uh, a so-called rural settlement with people living as, as they were in the Iron Age, but carrying on into the Roman period. Here we've got Roman culture, Roman material culture, the sorts of pottery and the tiles and all the rest of it, which are associated with Roman buildings. But another, and perhaps the second point, more important one, is that we've found a, a new type of site, a site which is not a Roman villa. Uh, it might be on the edge of a Roman villa. Uh, and it is something I've never excavated before. I've got about 50 years experience of digging on quite a lot of different Roman sites. I've never come across this particular combination of very simple buildings um, and oh, quite a lot of Roman finds and, and, and so on. So it's a very, very interesting site to excavate. It's an unusual one and it's one that uh, is worthy of you know, further investigation to fully understand what's going on here. <laughs> That's Man Manny Hinge's wolf, obviously, at the end there. Um, just very briefly to wrap up, since time is, is pushing, um, the, we did carry on after 2022, last year, 2023, we found a roundhouse by expanding Trench 12. Um, and that's what you can see there. You can see the curve of the roundhouse on the uh, right, -hand, right hand side there. Um, and uh, as we suspected, it dates to the Roman period. Um, it had, for instance, a Roman pot embedded um, into the ground. It was probably a water storage uh, pot in the floor of the roundhouse. Um, and that's an early Roman piece of pottery. Um, and we also found some quite interesting bits and pieces uh, on, the, on the site, including shale. This is uh, Kimmeridge shale from Dorset. It's part of a piece of furniture carved out of shale. Um, and that's another view of the, of the roundhouse. So this dates to the first, second century AD. And the uh, building with the floor in it, the, tess the tessellated floor, is probably third to fourth century AD. And of course, round here, um, 
we have uh, places with roundhouses. This is Pennington on the right-hand side, um, near Pennington Marshes, um, and the one on the uh, left-hand side is at Downton, um, going over towards Milford, uh, New, New Milton, that sort of area. Uh, and in both of them, you can see the very distinctive circular gullies of the sort that we have got at Brockenhurst. Um, and, well, we've seen this already. But, uh, that's a box flue tile and a piece of New Forest decorated pottery as well. Uh, and these are pieces of Roman roof tile broken up deliberately. Um, there are chisel marks along here to remove part of the tile, probably to make the little tessery. Um, and that's a, a, a circular tile, column tile. Um, we've got no columns on the site, but we've got the column tiles, which is quite interesting. Uh, and we have some quite fancy pieces of pottery. Um, no, a cat for scale there, just to give you some idea. Um, and this, uh, this is a very fine piece of pottery. It's decorated Samian ware from central Gaul, made near Clermont-Ferrand in the central part of France. Um, and it's signed by the potter, B-A-N-V-I, for a person called Banvus, who was active at the end of the second, beginning of the third century AD. I was very happy to find this. I did my PhD on potters like this, uh, not on villas or anything like that. It was on Roman pottery. Um, and uh, actually, to dig one up uh, in a real excavation, is, rather than just seeing them in museums, is a very interesting uh, experience and an exciting thing to find. Um, that's a museum-worthy specimen. And it could be completely reconstructed quite easily. So there was, some, as I say, some wealth on this site, but the buildings are down market buildings. They're just ordinary sort of outbuildings. So if we look at a map, um, here's the site. It's near the pig, um, a restaurant and that sort of area. There are several Roman sites. There's another Roman site nearer the pig and periwood uh, enclosure, as it's called here. Um, we were, uh, there are other traces of Roman occupation running up along here on the road that goes towards Bewley. Um, this is the Roman road from Lindhurst, well, from Cadnam via Lindhurst to Buckland Rings. Um, and that is the road called Sway Road, of course. Uh, that leads off and ends up down at the salt marshes and all the rest of it. It's a so-called salt way. Um, and... Uh, uh, maybe where Brockenhurst uh, Manor House grounds are, that might be where there's a villa, a real villa, <laughs> not the edge of a villa, which is what we appear to have. So, what's happening? That photo was taken this morning on the left-hand side. Um, it was a nice day today until hailstorms and things like that swept in um, and the weather got a bit colder. Uh, here we are doing uh, geophysics in uh, uh, New Cops enclosure, tapes laid out, and just about make out the machinery there. Um, and these are some of the results of the geophysics in 2003, not, not today's results, they haven't been processed. Um, and these are plotted onto the LIDAR. Um, and uh, what we've got here is the possibility we were digging a roundhouse just here. There might be another roundhouse just there. Um, there's certainly some other bits and pieces like uh, enclosures and so on, which we, might be, we will be digging this coming summer. And that's some more detail of the, the LIDAR. With the eye of faith, you can make out features in it. But uh, you have to be, uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's easy enough doing geophysics, but actually the skill is in the interpretation of results, as ever. <laughs> Um, and that, that's the LIDAR plotted onto the site, site plan. We've, we're going to aim for that area here, and we were doing more geophysics over here, and we think there's going to be more there as well. So we're digging this summer. Um, and, uh, yes, it's, uh, it's, if the weather's good, it's a beautiful site because of the high big trees, ancient oaks and so on, and we're digging underneath them. So at that point... Uh, thank you very much indeed.
seems to be one over there. Quite high status Roman buildings on the Isle of Wight. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I'm just wondering, would they have um, come over and done some exploration in the forest? And could this be like a holiday home or a, <laughs> a, a place to explore and, and to maybe hunt? Um, I don't know. Well, uh, and one of the things about the new forest in the Roman period is, of course, we've got to wish away most of the trees. Um, and the fact that it, it became a, a royal hunting forest in the uh, Norman period. Um, and there, it was cultivated land. Um, and we, I personally think that around the south edge of the New Forest, places like Sway, where there's tessery have been found in Sway, possibly in Hordle as well, um, and uh, uh, there may be buildings at uh, Cowshot too. So along the south side of the New Forest, there may well be more Roman buildings waiting to be discovered. Um, you're absolutely right in saying the Isle of Wight has got some pretty fancy Roman villas, uh, such as Newport and particularly Braiding. Um, and uh, uh, there is a, a, a fancy Roman villa in the north side of the New Forest as well at Rockbourne. Um, so uh, what's going on in the New Forest is still a bit of an enigma. It needs, but I think with further investigation, we might start to clarify whether it, it had true villa settlement or um, fairly, uh, what, you know, what the standard they were at and that sort of thing. We need to establish that. Thank you very much. Any questions? There's one over there. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Um, it's a little bit earlier, but I wondered what your views were on the approval of the tunnel at Stonehenge. <laughs> I think it's a good thing, <laughs> which is controversial, actually. Um, I, I actually, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a long area of debate, um, but a lot of archaeologists did originally start out by thinking it was a good thing. Quite a few have turned against it since. Um, it uh, will be a big opportunity for archaeology. Now, archaeologists, of course, uh, to be cynical about it for a second, are hand in hand with developers because our bread and butter is the destruction of sites and therefore the archaeologists can get in to discover what's there. <laughs> um, which maybe I shouldn't be saying, but I had just done so. Um, and uh, uh, it will be a golden opportunity for a, a, an extraordinary trench um, close to Stonehenge across that landscape with all its barrows and things like that. But have, um, and it, I mean, obviously, people like driving past Stonehenge and seeing it in the distance. Um, and uh, I, I too like doing that. Um, but uh, on the World Heritage designation would be taken away if that tunnel or some sort of diversion of the A303 doesn't happen. Say so what? Yeah, possibly so what? Do you like driving past Stonehenge? You want to, do you want to see a tunnel? Who wants to see a tunnel? Yeah. Quite, well, who wants to leave it as it is? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. We could easily have a debate on this, but it's perhaps for a separate occasion. <laughs> it's a very interesting topic, and quite a controversial one, as you can see. Can I just ask a quick question? Have you been to the Roman villa at um, uh, the Newt? In yes, yes, yeah. I have. Would you recommend that to someone? Yes, I think um, the Friends of St. Barb ought to organise an ex expedition <laughs> to it. It, um, it, it is extremely good and well worth going to see. It's a reconstruction of a Roman villa near Wincanton in Somerset. Um, the newt. For newt. And the Newt is a sort of rather fancy country club, isn't it? Well, it's, it's a hotel. If you want to just visit for the day, it's about £30. Yeah, my you... nephew, who was front of house manager for the hotel, has just resigned, which is really annoying. <laughs> the, the Roman villa is a separate entrance. Yeah. And it's got its own um, museum, but 
Uh, it's a complete reconstruction of a villa. It has a working hypercost, um, and uh, you can go and see what a triclinium looked like with its couches and tables and all the rest of it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's well worth going to. And the side is very good, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Colleague at the back will run around with the... Has any further excavation been done on the um, Roman villa at Downton, the Wiltshire Downton? I don't know. I don't, and that's a site that's been known for some time, of course, yes. and it's got a mosaic which is in uh, Salisbury Museum. Um, but uh, for recent work, I, I've got no, I have to confess, I don't actually know if anything has been going on recently there. There's another question. Um, two questions. Yes, although, uh, having said that a third of the population in Italy were slaves, that wouldn't apply in Britain. It would be much, much lower in Britain. Um, the slaves weren't necessarily all Roman. Um, they could be prisoners of war from the frontier areas. They often had Greek names, but they'd been renamed, so their original names are unknown. So... Uh, yeah, slavery is a very, you know, well, obviously a very controversial issue. Um, but uh, uh, there were pe people of quite high um, status were slaves. A lot of doctors were slaves or freed slaves. Well, because um, they were being employed by wealthy families. And that, yeah. And eventually, uh, if you survived, as it were, uh, slaves were usually freed, and they became freedmen. So it's a different system from, say, American uh, colonial slavery. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, you mentioned Buckland Rings earlier, and um, connection with the, the routes running up towards Brockenhurst. Um, there is a road which we most of us know called Silver Street. Oh, yes, yes. Which runs west. It does. And I've often thought, uh, is there any relevance to the fact that it's called Street? And was it something, yeah. once they'd gone to the camp, taken it over, yeah. they headed west? Is there, any, is there anything, any evidence for that? Um, I think the, the evidence is thin, but I think it's a very suggestive name. And on the first edition ordnance survey maps from the early part of the 19th century, it's marked as a Roman road. Um, it goes from Buckland Rings, past the Wheel Inn, to Gordle, and if you actually don't go round Gordleton Mill, you go straight across, as it were. It meets up with the other alignment of Silver Street. Um, and um, it would eventually end up joining up with the lower part, lower A337, and the place it's aiming for is Hengisbury Head. And that sort of area, a mouth of the rivers there. Uh. Thank you. Any other questions? Or can we let Tony... Oh, one more. How many thousands of Romans were there in England? Ah, the number of people from Rome was probably under 100. What, under 100,000? 100. A hundred. These are the elite administrators, the governor... Uh, the generals of the army and all the rest of it. Everybody else who came to, to Roman Britain would have come from other provinces, places like Spain and Germany and Gaul and the uh, eastern provinces perhaps, much rarer. But uh, uh, the number of incomers in Roman Britain was also probably rather low. I suspect that 80% of the population was local born only 20% were incomers. Well, that's a guess. And the population of Roman Britain, something like six, seven, eight million, something like that. Right, okay. That was absolutely brilliant, Tony. Thank you once again. Um, it's brought a bit of sunshine to the evening and a great deal of entertainment. Thank you very much. Um, can I just make one more announce? Now you've had a really lovely talk, um, and we do know the benefits of being a friend of St. Barb are, are great. You're all getting a, having our, our uh, friends opening on the 16th of May. 
But unfortunately, the cost of living has caught up with us, and from April, we will be putting the Friends membership up just a little bit, and you'll all be getting notification um, over the next week or so. Um, it's not very much, but unfortunately, the, it's just for, well, we all know, don't we? The cost of living has gone, gone through the roof, and I'm afraid we've had to um, increase our prices just a little. The, the general entrance will be going up, because the Friends membership is always tied to the cost of the general entrance, so they're both going up a little bit in, in April. So sorry about that, but thank you, Tony, once again for a brilliant talk, and don't forget that the next one is going to be different again, and we'll hope to see you on the 16th of May for a drink and a new exhibition opening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.